Hello, everybody. We are definitely live. And uh, my name is Jackie Faraday. I'm an astrophysicist at the American Museum of Natural History. And I'm going to be your host today for what's usually our astronomy live programs, where we take you on these immersive tours of outside of our uh, outside planet Earth. But it's climate week, and we've chosen a topic today, which you might be seeing all over the news, fire. Fires are kind of on many people's minds. Fires are kind of raging uh, across our planet in some ways. And so we decided we were going to take astronomy visualizations that we usually do, put them together with this important topic and bring in some experts. So what we have is Carter Emmert. Carter, hello. Hi, Carter. Jackie. Great to be here again. Yeah, Carter, you are going to be flying Open Space, our visualization software today. And delivering some content. And then our content expert, Dr. Natasha Stavros, who is a fire scientist, and she'll tell us about that later, fire scientist at the University of Colorado Boulder. Hi, Natasha. Hey, how are you? Good. We're so glad to have you and to get started. And so I'm going to hand it over to you guys. But before I do, I just want to say that um, you guys should use the chat, the YouTube chat, for all of your questions, whatever you see today. You actually have three science experts that are in the chat with you that will be answering away. Dr. C. Yuan Wang, who is a smoke and air quality expert. Dave Zader, who's a former fire management officer. And Dr. Virginia Iglesias, a fire hazard expert. They can answer your questions there. I'll be hosting by popping in, bringing your live questions to our content experts. And with that, I'll, I'll send it over to you guys to take it away. Great, sounds good. Well, Carter, why don't we pull out and look at Earth with all of these satellites around it? Um, fires can have continental and global impact, which we can see from space using a collection of different satellites. So what you see here are the orbits of uh, different satellites in yellow and in orange. And um, if, we, if we zoom out further, we can actually look at the GOES track um, GOES is a satellite and it gets its name from being a geostationary satellite. And so even though it says geostationary in the name, you can see in this orbit track that it's actually moving. And you might think, okay, but it's geostationary. Geostationary is a reference to what it's viewing on Earth. And so it's moving, the orbit is moving at the same speed as the Earth so that it's constantly looking at the same place. So if we zoom in, you can see goes east-west, looks over the United States and the Northern Hemisphere. Now, uh, what I'll do, uh, I'll get rid of the track of goes, but uh, show what it actually sees. So here we go. So here you can see goes east-west of the United States. And at nighttime, you can see these little yellow dots. And as Carter zooms in on the left-hand side of North, uh, on the Western coast of North America, you can see these little yellow dots here. Those are our cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco. And while the daylight, it's very hard to tell what's smoke and what's clouds. Um, at nighttime, we can use infrared to be able to, to differentiate clouds from smoke. So what you're seeing here is I, that- I can, I can point out the urban areas at, at night uh, right here. I'll just point out Los Angeles, San Francisco, and uh, up here, Seattle and Portland. Um, this was that week, uh, the, the worst week of the burning uh, the, of the smoke of last uh, September, last year, between the 8th and, and 16th. Yeah, and so smoke can travel, you can see here that smoke can travel vast distances depending on how hot a fire burns, which affects how high the smoke enters the atmosphere and consequently how far it travels. Where it goes depends on the atmospheric circulation patterns. So as smoke carried by wind, um, other places can be affected downwind. So what you see is that the fires that happen in California actually affect the Midwest. And so in this case, the Midwest is downwind of those fires. And Chicago. Yep, there we go, there's the Midwest. So how people are affected depends on the chemistry of the smoke. So Carter, can we show the smoke chemistry? 
Sure. I'll back out just a little bit, Natasha, so that uh, we can see that, and I'll just switch over to um, that uh, that animation here. Great. So here you can see the chemistry um, of sulfate, which is what you see in green, and black carbon, which is what you see in purple or blue. And so for clarity, black carbon is like ash floating in the atmosphere. There are many gases and aerosols like this that are hard to see with our naked eye, but using different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can distinguish what's there. Smoke with lots of aerosols can make the skies look orange and red because the molecules are similar in size to visible light, which scatters visible colors like green and blue, typically making the sky look blue, um, to make the skies appear red and orange. It's important to note that there are a lot of sources of emissions and not just fires. So Carter is taking us over Asia, and I think you're gonna dim the, there we go, so we can really see China and India there. So as you can see over China, there is more black carbon or blue and purple, which is primarily produced from coal burning. And over India, there's more sulfate or green a product of biomass burning from stoves and agriculture, but there is still some black carbon because they, they do, do still burn coal there. So changing the colors of the skies is similar to what we see on Venus that has lots of clouds of sulfur di dioxide and rain in the form of sulfuric acid. So let's fly over to Venus. So I'll, I'll pull out now so that we're actually, you see some lines can, uh, come up. These are the the orbital trails of first the moon that goes around the earth here, but also the earth's uh, orbital trail around the sun. So if I pull back far enough, we'll uh, be able to see the sun will come into the picture. And so we see uh, the inner planets. Um, we see Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then there's Mars out here. There's Jupiter, Saturn, and so on. But uh, let's actually target Venus and I'll fly over there uh, for you, Natasha. Hold on to your seats. <laughs> All right, so about 2.5 billion years ago, Venus had an ocean, but because it was closer to the sun, the ocean evaporated and water vapor disintegrated, allowing hydrogen to escape the atmosphere and enter space. With no hydrogen and no possibility of water returning to the surface, carbon dioxide built up in the atmosphere and was, was uh, in what's called a runaway greenhouse effect. This led to an atmosphere today with 90 times more carbon dioxide than Earth. This is actually why we go to other planets to understand the conditions that support life and habitability on our own planet. Did you know that temperatures on Venus surface reach 864 degrees Fahrenheit or 462 degrees Celsius, which is actually cooler than the heat of a wildfire? Fires with flames one meter tall can exceed 1,472 degrees Fahrenheit or 800 degrees Celsius. Often technology we create for space exploration like robotic drones to look at Venus can help us with challenges in our everyday lives like building robotic drones to help map fires. And to get a global view, oh, I will say here, this is, this is a prescribed fire from drone. And then I think the other clip um, was a wildfire. So you can see the difference in, in intensity. Um, and so a prescribed fire is something that's done by uh, somebody who's authorized to prescribe the fire on the landscape. Um, whereas this is an ignition that has gone out of control and is burning everything in its path. So, to get a global view, we can use satellites. So Carter, can you show the MODIS sensor active fire detections from every 10 days? So this is uh, MODIS showing you active hot spots every 10 days in 2009. And as Carter moves around the globe, you can see that fires actually have different seasonality. So fires will be, there will be more fires at different times of the year, depending on where you are. Natasha, we got two things I wanted to bring up. One was that we were just over on Venus, and I think it's good to remind everybody, if you weren't aware, 
you were mentioning how this is why we go. We have these missions to other worlds. And there are two that were just selected to go to Venus. And so you might have that on your head and in, in your head, or you might have seen it in, um, in the news. Da Vinci and Veritas are two NASA missions that will be headed to Venus to study it. And then to pull in a question from the chat, George was asking about the extent of wildfires, if they're getting worse on the planet. It might be really heavily tied into what you're showing here. Yeah, that's it really depends on where you are um, and what what you mean when you define fires um, as getting worse. Uh, so some areas we're seeing more burned area, hotter, more intense, more severe. And in other places, we actually are seeing less fire. Um, and so this actually is a really great, great point, because um, what I wanted to say next was that fires occur all over the world. but they're not always what we call a mega fire. Mega, mega fires are what we care about most, and they are often viewed as destructive and damaging. So just destructive fires are fires that degrade air quality, like we've been talking about, and fires that kill people and destroy homes. So Carter, let's turn off the video and show just September 2021, right now, um, the active fire detections with maps of population density. We'll switch over to uh, our uh, our colleagues from NASA uh, with um, the uh, Worldview uh, tool, which we can hopefully I'll we'll see that in a second here. Yeah, great. Which anybody could pull this up, right? Yes this this is uh, this is a website that combines um, hundreds of layers of of data, which are basically being collected uh, by NASA's Earth Observing System, along with uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, together, the two agencies manage the GOES satellite. Uh, but <clears throat> thanks to uh, NOAA uh, that supplied the imagery of GOES that we were showing uh, um, animated just a short while ago. But uh, this is uh, NASA's compilation and you can also go through time. So you can see different time loaded depending on, on your date. Yeah. And we can, we can make this link available in the chat. So we'll have this for anybody that's curious how to get to this website and follow along. So what you're seeing here, what Carter's showing you is this, the, the dark red spots, these big red clusters, um, those are urban areas because that's where we have really high population density. I think we saw some people from New York who are on this uh, in the in the live chat, um, and then there's some Chicago and um, Louisiana over to Los Angeles, and so what you're seeing with those bright red colors, those are active fires. So if we zoom in a little bit, we can actually see that the fires um, happening in California right now, these really big ones. Um, right in the Sierra Nevadas or at the base of the Sierra Nevadas, they're actually quite far from populations, which is a good thing. But there's some fires up near San Francisco that are and near Los Angeles that are closer to populations. And so these, even though they're not as big, might be more destructive for homes. And so um, destructive fires also depend on how a fire burns, how often and the type of ecosystem. So Carter, can you show the vegetation layer instead of population density? Sure, I'll switch over to that. Uh, here we have the vegetation. Yep. Okay, so ecosystems fall on a spectrum from fuel limited, like in Southern Africa, which I'll give Carter a second to fly on over to Southern Africa. Um, and what a fuel limited system is, is one where it's really hot and dry, but there's not as much fuel. So if we zoom in a little bit more. I'll just show what's fire, what's vegetation in this case. And then uh, let's zoom in. Yeah. yeah. So if we go, go up just a little bit, mm -hmm. there we go. So you can see how dense the forests are and how green it is just a little bit north. And then just south of it, you see a lot more fire, um, but less vegetation. So this is more of a fuel limited system. Um, and if we go over to the Amazon, that is what we would call something that is more of a flammability limited system. So what you can see here is that even though this is the dry season in South America, there's a lot less fires that are happening 
in the rainforest because it's actually quite moist. So there's a lot of fuel, but the conditions aren't quite right. Now there are still some fires that are creeping in and that has to do with deforestation um, and human effects. And another uh, flammability limited system is the Arctic. So let's take a look at the Arctic. As we as we kind of shift over, Natasha, there's there's a number of questions that are related to climate change and how it is impacting fires. One that I wanted to bring up uh, that Dave David T was asking that prior to the significant impacts uh, of climate change by humans, what portion uh, burned on a yearly basis, whether it's the West or the Amazon or Africa, like what was the natural burn versus the significant increase? That's a really great question. And it's actually, I don't have a very good answer because um, we don't know what the natural world would look like without human intervention and use of fire. Um, in fact, humans have been using fire for 92,000 years um, to alter the landscape. And so um, for uh, sustenance, you know, nutrient, uh, nutrition, um, nutrient cycling, uh, flushing prey out to be able to hunt. And so um, we don't actually know what a natural world would look like without human intervention. Um, and where fire is and how much burns is very dependent on where on the globe you're, you're talking about. And so it's hard to give a, a one answer or a single answer over the entire earth. Makes sense. So if we zoom in to the Arctic, Carter, can you? zoom in a little bit there. So you can see it's not as green as what we saw in the Amazon, but it's actually still a, a flammability limited system. Um, you know, it's it's cooler, generally wetter, more moisture because you've got a lot of snow. So where's the fuel, right? There's not as much, there's not as many trees. Well, a lot of the fuel is actually in the ground and in the form of peat and tundra. And so as that burns, it can actually produce as much smoke or more smoke than the Amazon. And so this really ties back to your question about climate change, because as we start to warm the planet and the Arctic becomes hotter and drier and more susceptible to fire, which we've seen in the last two years, um, the Arctic has really been on fire. We are really burning through very old carbon reserves and, and putting all of that carbon into the atmosphere. And this is really going to continue to contribute to uh, greenhouse the greenhouse effect. I, I think we have another question that would be good at this point too. And it comes from Amber and it's on with the increasing kind of fires that are, are, are going on. I think this is really a question about air quality. Is it eventually gonna take a toll on the balance of the elements around Earth making it much more difficult to breathe in the long run for our planet? I mean, that's an extensive question, I know, but. Yeah, well, if you remember from the beginning, and um, I, Carter, I'm not sure if you can go, go there quickly and then come back here, but uh, if you remember in the beginning when we were looking at the smoke and its transport over the globe, you can see that, 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 that emissions can actually travel quite far. And so as we increase the amount of smoke in the atmosphere, and if it's from really hot fires um, in places that did not historically burn and are now burning at very high intensity, the likelihood of that smoke going very high into the atmosphere and sticking around for a while is very high. And so, you know, just a reminder here that, yeah, you can experience, you can breathe the smoke from fires on a completely different continent. So we, I would just say that New York City saw the effects of the California fires in our skies with some really beautiful sunsets. So it's, we see it's, it's, in, it's interesting in, in this animation is, is that at first, uh, as the fires really kicked up, there was an offshore breeze, but the circulation uh, just a few days later actually carries that across the continent. And you'll you'll see that quite clearly here. Um, let me just uh, um, make sure that uh, we're just seeing that full on. Um, and um, But uh, I think as this daylight comes around, we can now see, especially in this day where it comes across, this is Chicago right here. 
and uh, and then all the way across to uh, the the Northeast Corridor here, and then out across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And some of those emissions, like we've even seen smoke particles from um, the United States up in the uh, glaciers up in Greenland. And um, in 20, September 2020, we saw some of the smoke that actually transported all the way over to Europe and across the Atlantic Ocean. So smoke can travel very far. Um, and so, you know, what makes a, a megafire is the, are these smoke impacts and the, their proximity to populations and the effect that they have on the ecosystems. And so um, one important thing to remember is that as fires burn more frequently because of climate change, we risk ecosystems changing from what you see today to something more adapted for a hotter, drier future with more fire. And so one of the scary things about fires that you hear about in the news are fires that happen near people and fires that travel really fast, too fast for anybody to actually be able to evacuate. So what makes a fire burn really fast? So here you can see a model simulation of how the 2014 California King fire burned in the Sierra Nevadas. And um, it's using three ingredients, topography like steep slopes, hot and dry weather that creates wind, which you can see from these red arrows and fuel or vegetation. And topography matters because the laws of physics tell us that hot air rises as the fire is in the canyon and produces heat, like you see in this Rubicon River Valley. Um, hot air will dry the fuels out above it on the steep slopes and make them more flammable. This combined with the wind generated from hot air rising and cool air entering below propel the fire forward, making it travel really, really fast, which you're about to see right now. And this fire, as you see, whoa, boom, it's really accelerating up this canyon. And this run that you're watching um, burned 30,000 football fields in just one day. So think about running one football field and this fire is traveling 30,000 football fields in one day and just burning everything. And I went and visited this fire afterwards and there was nothing left. All of, the, all of the trees were just charred sticks. Now that's not to say that that ecosystem isn't going to come back because fire is actually really important. Um, ecosystems do need fire. The problem is, is when the fire happens like this and it happens too frequently and the trees and the ecosystem's not able to recover, um, we actually, leave, it can make the ecosystem more likely to change into something like a grassland instead of a forest. This, this actually brings in another question, Natasha, from Bella. And that's the, um, when we hear about prescribed fires that are probably these needed things, what's the, can you, can you answer this one? What's the purpose of these prescribed fires that are going on as well? Yeah. Prescribed fires um, are used to help remove some of the fuel and the vegetation. And in fact, um, there's lots of plants that are adapted and need fire. So, so many pine trees, for example, their cones are serotonous, which means they won't actually open and drop their seeds unless there's intense heat. And so the next generation cannot grow without a fire. And so, with this in mind, we know that certain ecosystems need fire. And we also know that, you know, let, not letting fire be on the landscape for a long time and then having fire occur all at once can be really, really damaging both for humans and for ecosystems. And so a prescribed fire is where we say, well, let's, in, let's introduce fire in a safe way and allow that ecosystem to have fire um, in order for it to have functions like regeneration um, and nutrient cycling um, and so it, the important thing there is to remember that prescribed fires are done by professionals um, who know what they're doing. Um, and uh, professionals can be uh, tribal leaders and they can also be uh, fire management um, certified by the state and federal lands. So 
it, can I jump back over to the, the physics of like what makes a fire move really fast? Because this is actually the exact same um, thing that we see when we look at a candle flickering. So the heat from the flame moves up as the cool air around it rushes in um, where the hot air was. And this is what creates the little dance of the flame. Nice. This is, this is so much stuff, Natasha, and I'm learning so much about fires that I'm both uh, happy I know now and I am feel so informed that I feel a little frightened about the planet. Also safe, though, because you're making me feel safe. Um, is, there, is there other things? We're, we're closing up on some of our time, but are there other things that you want to cover here? Yeah, I think I, I covered um, some of the things I wanted to talk about with um, the use of prescribed fires. So thank you for that question. Um, I will say, you know, as I mentioned, we've been using fire for 92,000 years. There's no natural world without fire. Um, and also, um, we've been using fire not just for um, hunting and gathering, but also fire, um, humans are deeply connected with fire. And there have been studies that have shown that humans are the way we are today because we were able to use fire to cook our foods and get more caloric and nutrient rich food to power our brains to evolve the way that they did. And so I think that that's a really important message is just to remember how important fire is and how connected we all are through fire. Yeah, I think that's very true. And fire is a critical part. I, I, I just wanted to give an anecdote too in watching this show Survivor that is very popular that is a key. They always say fire is the key to surviving on that. Yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Survivor reality. Yeah. Um, there is another question I wanted to bring in, which might link, link us to some more resources. And this question comes from Deepan Sikar. And that is about wind. Uh, do we have any innovations at all to control the wind patterns? interesting ask of a question there. Um, but also maybe how do you watch for the winds and what's the relationship that you see between the winds and fires, Natasha? Yeah, so we don't, we can't control wind and, and wind is actually one of these variables where it's extremely hard to predict. So when you hear about climate change, you'll hear about expected temperature changes or expected precipitation, pat, uh, changes in patterns of precipitation. But wind is one of those that we really, really don't have a whole lot of confidence in being able to predict. And so it's it's less about being able to control wind, which is very often our instinct, um, especially when we're afraid. We want to reach out and control something. But I think it's more important for us to remember that um, rather than trying to control, let's be let's be aware of what's happening. And so my favorite way of being aware is through this this. Uh, link, which is going to be put in the chat for you, um, windy.com. And you can download this as an app and you can view it in your browser. And why I really like this app is because it's got global coverage. So whether you're in Australia or Africa or South America or the United States or Asia, you can check in here. And what's really cool about this is it's pulling in satellite data from all over the world in a really dynamic platform that you can play with. And so what you see here on the right with, with the mouse um, is that there's so many different data layers you can turn on. And I, and um, so some of, some of my favorite ones, if we could just, yeah, there we go. So you can turn on the wind vector. So if you just click on that one. So this is the wind movement. And so the color bar um, is in the lower right hand corner and it'll tell you how fast those are. And then you can also see it with the dynamic overlay of these sort of wind vectors that are telling you the direction and how fast that it's going. Um, you can also look at thunderstorms, you can look at snow, precipitation. Yep, there you go. So thunderstorms um, can be one source of ignitions. Um, you can look at humidity, so how dry is an area. You can see the United States right now is super dry. Um, speaking from Colorado, I've, we've been running our humidifier. Um, you can also look at air quality. So you can look at nitrous oxide, particulate matter 2.5, PM 2.5. That's that's your black carbon. That's 
the stuff that you breathe into your lungs. And so you can actually see that it's really intense right there. So I wonder what's going on in California if we turn on the fire intensity layer. You can actually see that, hey, we actually have some fires that are happening there. And so this is one thing. And if we zoom in even closer to those fires, yep. So one thing I will do when I hear about a fire in my area is I will come in and I'll look and say, okay, well, where is the fire and what direction are the winds going in? And while the winds are not perfectly accurate at any given location, they can tell you the general direction of the winds um, and the trends. And so I really like this app. Um, I will. I want to show one other feature on this app, uh, which is let's look at carbon monoxide. So we all know that carbon monoxide is really toxic, right? We have carbon monoxide um, detectors in our homes. And so what's cool about this is that you can actually see the carbon monoxide and you can run it through time to see how it dissipates. So go ahead and hit that in the lower left. You can see it running through time. And carbon monoxide actually has a relatively short um, half-life. And so it doesn't stick around in the atmosphere for too long, which is why you see it sort of just sitting over California and not trans trans very far. Um, now, that's not to say that it doesn't happen. Um, it really is a function of how hot that fire is and how far it goes into the atmosphere. But you won't see this carbon monoxide really get over to New York, let's say. We've got a couple other questions, Natasha, I wanted to, to bring to your attention from the chat. One of them from George again, and this is on the kinds of fires that have been raging on the planet that people have been seeing so much of in social media. And that's um, how severe and likely are fires like the one that was seen in Greece earlier this year expected to take place. And that could be, probably be valid for the fires in, sit in Australia from, from right before the pandemic. What's your take on this? Yeah, well, so... If you remember, we talked about fuel limited and flammability limited and fuel limited systems actually aren't going to change a whole lot um, because they're already hot and dry. And so if you just make them hot, more hot and dry, it, it, you know, you're not necessarily increasing the fuel um, because fuel limited systems actually need to have rain in order for there to be fire because the rain is what grows the grasses, it grows the fuels. So in places where you're flammability limited and you have a lot of fuel and it's gonna get hotter and drier, you're gonna see more intense fires. And, um, as the, and, and as we see more of those fires happening in those areas, you might see type conversion. And so that ecosystem may switch from being something flammability limited to something a little more fuel limited, where it doesn't have as much, as much fuel or vegetation to burn. And so it really depends on where you are and it depends on the type of ecosystem that you're in. Is, is there a part of the world that you're monitoring right now that you look at and it keeps you up at night because you're worried or uh, is, that even, is that even a thing? Well, I, most of my research is in the United States, um, but I do talk with uh, the Australians a lot about what's happening over there. Um, I am really, really, really concerned about fires in the tropics because that's where we're going to see a lot of type conversion. And I'm also really nervous about fires in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. um, Arctic fires are really interesting. Um, you can actually have something in the Arctic called a zombie fire. And zombie fires actually occur in the ground and you can't actually see them from satellites. And what ends up happening is the fire's burning and as it's burning, it's generating a lot of heat and it's drying out all the moisture that's in front of it. And this creates air pockets where there can be oxygen that then sustains the flame and the, flame and, and the fire can burn underground for months, sometimes years. And that's really scary because there's so much carbon up there. And it really is one of those things where you know, the concern, and I, not to say that we'll end up like Venus um, anytime in the near future. Remember that happened 2.5 billion years ago. But that's where the concern is with this positive feedback loop of emissions. So humans may have put um, a lot of carbon up into the atmosphere that really initiated this greenhouse effect, but there's going to be natural feedbacks that occur that is going to exacerbate the issue. And so it, at some point, it kind of just is an issue that gets worse and worse and it doesn't matter who started it. Fair. 
Uh, speaking of this, one last question from the chat, which I knew this was going to come up, but Vivian has been asking, uh, do other planets have fire? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so I can't speak for all planets. Um, every single star in our galaxy can have planets around them. And so there are literally billions of potential planets out there that could have fire on them. But within our solar system, um, none of the other planets have enough oxygen to sustain fire. And this is really key because there's three ingredients for there to be fire, oxygen, fuel, and heat. And so without the oxygen, you can't have the fire, which is the same thing that happens when you see a candle and you put a cup over the top of it and you remove the supply of oxygen, the fire will go out. And so that's, that's why you don't see fire on other planets. Yeah, that's fair. And we, we do see volcanoes that erupt uh, on other worlds, but fire is a very different thing. Carter, I know you have opinions about volcanoes on other worlds, but... Well, it's just, it's just that, uh, you know, the planets have been built, you know, their surfaces by volcanism and in certain cases of terrestrial planets. Um, we have icy venting and uh, of liquid water, um, the case of, uh, um, well, Enceladus uh, at, uh, um, at Saturn and, and Io, we have uh, sulfurous volcanoes and, and there may be geysers, in fact, on, on uh, Europa, Io and Europa both being around Jupiter. So it's it's certainly exciting as as uh, as this this venting uh, occurs and and uh, but that um, this hot material comes up whether it's it's not combusting in, in the case of oxygen but uh, um, certainly hot uh, material coming up and and uh, spreading out across the surfaces of other planets. Now the, the way we use the word fire is is quite unique to our planet um, in the solar system and that. Brings me to kind of the last wrap up question for you, Natasha, which is how did you become a fire scientist? What was your path to this? Yeah, so I um, actually got my bachelor's degree in math and computer science. I really liked math because I thought it was a universal language. Didn't matter where you went. We all know what a number is. Um, and I, I really loved that. But I wanted to do something with applications. And so um, I had also received the advice that you should never have to pay for graduate school. And so I sent emails out to different professors and asked if they had funding and they were looking for a graduate student who knew math and computer science. And um, they said, well, we have a project on extreme fires and climate. And how do you feel about that? And being a girl from Southern California who had been evacuated, whose family had been evacuated twice in the early 2000s from some of the first mega fires um, in the 21st century and um, friends who had lost their childhood homes. I thought, well, that's a topic I could study. And the rest is history. That's amazing. Yeah. So you grew up close to the fires and that's brought you here to us. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for spending this 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 time with us on a Friday. Uh, it's been super informative. I hope everybody watching has gotten their new lessons on fire. Check out these sites that Natasha has has pointed us to as they're great for maintaining your fire knowledge. And um, Carter, thank you for the flight again. Always amazing to have you piloting this software. Oh, it's I've been looking forward to this to uh, show off some of this stuff and, and working with Natasha. Thank you, Natasha. Yeah, thank you. These visuals have been great. Yes, we love it. Uh, okay, so last last thing for those watching, your feedback is super important to us. And this is actually our first program since we've been back uh, after we took a summer hiatus. And I know lots of kids are in school right now, but we'd love to get some feedback from you. So we have a survey that we'd ask that you fill out. The link should be provided. It's now in StreamYard there. It'll be in the chat. Everyone who fills it out will get an NASA sticker in the mail. If you don't have an NASA sticker, you should because they are recognizable across the world. And last thing is save the date. We have another of these astronomy lives that we will be doing. And the next launch of this YouTube spaceship is Friday, October 8th 
at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And it's going to be reasons for the seasons. I will be hosting and I won't be hosting. I'll be giving the content on that one. So get ready, get excited, reasons for the seasons. And I think that's it. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody for tuning in and see you hopefully in two weeks.